Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Achieve More podcast. My name is Anthony, and you can find me on YouTube at Pittsburgh. Do a lot of videos there with my girlfriend where we travel, we go out, we have fun, we do cool stuff. So if you're into that, check it out. It's also the place where you can find the video format of this podcast. So if you want to see how incredibly handsome Michael, I, and our guest are today, uh, come on over to Pittsburgh on YouTube, and you can see our handsome faces. Um, again, my co-host is Michael. He has a YouTube channel called Huddle Card Collection. He also has a podcast every single Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a live podcast, so if you guys really like podcasts and you want to interact, come over to Huddle Card Collection on Wednesday nights and uh, take a look at uh, Collecting Profit, which is now going to be on its 89th episode. Yeah. Great uh, longevity. Uh, Michael, anything new going on over on uh, Huddle Card Collection? <clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, you summed it up right. Just, I'll just add to the people that are listening. If you're into sports cards, whether it be, you know, reselling, collecting, just talking about the hobby itself, come on over to Huddle Card. We'd love to have you. Yeah, it's a great time. Uh, without further ado, guys, uh, you know, we bring on special guests every single week to the podcast. Uh, without a Further ado, today we have Noah Healy on the podcast, and um, he does some really, really unique stuff, and he's an algorithmist. And Noah, without further ado, if you could introduce yourself and tell us what the heck an algorithmist does. <laughs> well, sure. So my name is Noah Healy. Uh, I, uh, I studied engineering, wound up with a concentration in nuclear engineering, um, back in the 90s and then needed a job and got a job at a dot-com company that was here local. I, I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so the, the sort of the engineering training kicked in. Uh, if you're going to be a professional, you should actually understand what it is that you're doing. And so I started reading all of the foundational papers, which on the internet, handily enough, are, are relatively easy to find and uh, have have trained myself up into an expert on computational mathematics. So the, the structure of the algorithms that underlie the systems that we use. And I've used that uh, training and hobby uh, to develop a new mechanism for doing price discovery for commodity markets, which I'm currently attempting to patent and popularize. That's awesome. So with that um, technology, like you talked about using algorithms to like populate things, um, could you describe that a little bit more like kind of how the algorithm works, um, kind of what you're using it to do, like those type of things? I have a little bit of a background with um, setting up marketplaces and stuff in the sports card realm. So um, I might have a little bit of a, a idea of how that works. But for people listening that are just listening, like, oh, my God, algorithms, numbers, like, how does this stuff work? Uh, could you kind of break it down in a simple way? Okay, yeah, sure. Well, uh, so a marketplace, to be quite familiar with from from card trading, uh, is a forum for people to come together to buy and sell. Uh, and at the base level, uh, particularly around cards, art, stuff like that, uh, what you're going to be into is usually either auctions or, or private trades. Um, a, a given thing is a given thing. Now, obviously, with cards, some cards are somewhat more commodified than others. Um, I'm not an expert on cards, but I do know that uh, you know some people become very, very famous and their rookie cards don't really exist in, in great numbers for whatever reason. And so those things become very valuable, whereas other people are sort of, you know, everybody knows that this is their year and the card companies make a lot of them and there's just tons of those lying around. Um, in general, commodity markets become valuable when there's a reason to trade the same thing over and over and over and over again over the course of many years, decades, or in most cases, permanently. Things like wheat markets, oil markets, uh, you know, steel markets. Uh, it's unlikely that we're going to stop having an interest in having these things as long as civilization exists. Uh, and so under those circumstances, 
we have this long-term interest in knowing not just where prices are right now, but where prices are going. And so what we do these days is we use futures markets where people can effectively make a bet on trades that might happen in the future, which they can capitalize on if they they win something. So you could, for example, uh, you know, a new crop of people hit hit the sport of your choice. You could you could buy a futures contract to sell rookie cards of some particular incoming rookie. Uh, you know, twenty five years from now, uh, after they they're in the Hall of Fame of, of their respective sport, that will pay off if they you know get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, but then, you know, in the likely event that you haven't correctly predicted this person's entire career, um, you know, you'll eat, you'll eat whatever the, the downside of that bet is under those circumstances. Uh, this makes a lot more sense, uh, again, for these systems where you are going to have an ongoing, uh, thing happening. Uh, so what happens for, for these kinds of markets is that what people are interested in is the ongoing price structure. Not so much that prices are going to keep going up um, because the price of food actually pretty much only goes up when inflation forces it to do that, um, or that it will keep going down uh, because that happens. Uh, there was a, a famous bet in the 70s between Paul Ehrlich and, uh, and an economist from the Chicago school whose name escapes me, uh, where they adjusted for inflation and it turned out that the commodity basket that Ehrlich had picked uh, had reduced in cost by, I think, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent over the course of a couple of decades, um, during which time human population had gone up by, I believe, more than a billion people. So um, technology allows us to make these things less expensive uh, at the same time that we need more of them because there's more of us. And so what my algorithm does is it separates the the trade into three pieces. Uh, there's a producer or somebody that actually has the product. There's a consumer, somebody that wants the product and has cash. And then there's a negotiator role, which producers and consumers can play that role, but they are acting on behalf of the entire marketplace, not just themselves. And so the goal of the market is to integrate together all the negotiation positions into an overall market position that producers and consumers can meet somewhat in the same way that you, you know, buy grocery store, grocery commodities. You know, you, 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 there's quoted prices. You don't really have any negotiating, you know, lateral in them. It's just, are these prices good for you or not? If they are, you use as much of them as you can. If you, if they aren't, you don't participate uh, and that's it. Um, and the system essentially aligns those interests so that the exchanges that happen at the prices that are being negotiated uh, pay off the people that negotiated those prices on a pro rata share based on you know how much of your information wound up being used by how many people and so on. Um, so that entire system becomes a stable marketplace. Interesting. Why, why are algorithms needed? Uh, well, algorithms turn out to be uh, much more general and much more ubiquitous than we had previously expected. Uh, so there's a one-to-one -one relationship between mathematical proofs, algorithms, and all physical processes. Uh, so like when you start your car, you're actually proving a mathematical theorem. It's fairly technical and difficult to figure out what exact mathematical theorem you're proving, and you'd have to break down your car's components to work out what it was, but you are, in fact, doing that. Um, so what algorithms do is essentially the same thing that machines do for us in physical space, just as you can have a machine that, you know, is an engine and drives some shaft at a high rate of revolution and does a lot of work for you as a result of doing that. Algorithms do the same thing in the space of information and imagination. And so it allows us to describe how, how to create machines that can do that processing for us. Oh, wow. 
How long does it take you to get into something like this uh, professionally? Is this uh, a more advanced type of career? It just seems like with all of the mathematics involved and stuff like that, um, this would be something that'd be more advanced. Uh, well, so I did not study this in school. And in fairness to me, uh, this is not something that they, in fact, teach in any college curricula that exist. Um, back in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s, uh, there were some comp sci and programming degrees that had more of a focus on the mathematical end of things. But uh, certainly since the, the, the aughts, uh, there's been a strong movement towards uh, basically trade school type training, even at places like MIT and Stanford, uh, where there's a mass emphasis on, on these underlying ideas. And this is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of very important problems that were effectively solved back in the 60s and 70s um, have been regressed by companies like Google and Amazon, who are doing things that waste enormous amounts of, of time and money. Uh, but they have the time and money to waste. So, you know, uh, they, they just go ahead and do that. Um, so in terms of what, what I had to go through, um, I'd say you're looking at probably in the neighborhood of a decade of, of uh, reading and studying uh, to pick up this particular brand of knowledge. Um, however, I would say that it's something that is very broadly applicable and it's it's a real shame um it this is very important foundational knowledge which virtually doesn't exist and it's led to a lot of very dumb things happening in in our economy uh and mm -hmm. possibly to the destruction of our economy in fact it's it's that dumb the things that are going on as we get more into it, as more, I guess, a digital age, will, will algorithms be used in all, uh, in a lot more aspects than they were previously? It seemed, you know, like, you know, as, as is it going to get to the point where an algorithm is going to be used as to, I don't know, what should go on a shelf in a certain spot in a certain store? So I think the first thing, and I, I tell this to almost everybody who asks me questions like this, is that you need to fix your tenses because that's already happened. Um, uh, one, of, one of the largest consumers of supercomputer time on earth is the Walmart Corporation, uh, which has been assiduously using algorithms for that purpose for quite some time. Uh, also Amazon, uh, which effectively is also sort of curating what your storefront looks like on their page uh, is using algorithms to do so. Uh, companies like Facebook and Twitter and, and dating apps and so on are effectively using algorithms to intermediate interpersonal uh, uh, relationships uh, at, at the fundamental level. I mean, there are families that are held together by Facebook uh, and that's, that's pretty awful considering how evil that corporation is. Um, so the algorithms, we have already fully integrated them into our society. Unfortunately, uh, we have not done so in ways that we, number one, understand, um, because like you, virtually everybody is like, well, what would happen if someday this thing right. that happened 25 years ago started? Um, well... <laughs> Uh, it happened 25 years ago. Um, the The effects of these things are are rather extraordinary. So, um, something worth considering uh, is that the financial sector uh, has effectively been growing as a fraction of the total human economy, uh, roughly since the, the the 70s, mid to late 70s, uh, on on a on a general increase. And that's also been the time of the computerization of the financial industry. So we had an algorithm that ran global finance that was 
the old market structure. And we started plugging computers and other algorithms into it in ways that from an algorithmic analysis point of view allows us to see that we in fact broke the marketplace. Um, unfortunately, the economics profession is not in fact trained in algorithmic analysis. Uh, and so they're, they're largely focused on how to break the marketplace even harder than it already has been. Uh, and we've seen that with things like, have you ever heard of the Black-Scholes equation? I've heard of it. I don't, I'm not familiar with what, I mean, I've heard those words, but I haven't, you know. Sure. Well, so the Black-Scholes, uh, Black and Scholes, and another guy whose name, again, escapes me, um, uh, worked this thing out. They wound up getting the Econ Nobel. They also founded something called Long-Term Capital Management, which was a hedge fund dedicated to international currency exchange. And what the Black-Scholes equation says is that if your marketplace has a normal distribution, that's a bell curve distribution style uh, uh, variance attached to it, then those futures I was talking about before, where you could make a bet on like whether or not this guy's rookie card is going to become the goat or something like that, there's a way to value those things before the payoff happens. And, and it's a relatively complicated, uh, you know, differential equation, but it gives you uh, a number back out. Um, so they were using that to project what the appropriate value price for uh, currency futures would be to do something called carry trades or, or similar types of ideas. Basically, uh, if you've got two currencies and they're gonna move relative to one another, you can buy the currency that's gonna go up relative to the other one. You can go borrow currency in that um, and or, or borrow the other currency, convert over, let it go up, convert back, pay off your loan and have money left over. Uh, <laughs> And, and there's other ways that are more sophisticated to do this, but this basic idea is called the carry trade. And this is essentially how global currency arbitrage sort of keeps everybody's money kind of honest with one another. Uh, so these guys were doing that. And this is a thing that people who do, do this at enormous degrees of leverage because they were the smartest guys in the world. They had an econ Nobel. They had, this, they had this equation that they were the only people that understood that told them they just had solved the marketplace. Um, they took on radically more leverage than anyone should ever have been allowed to, to possess. And um, to sort of make a long story short and to over embellish a little, they more or less borrowed all the money in the world and put it down on black. Uh, at the roulette table and and with everybody on earth betting against them, um, what do you know, it came up the other way. So uh, this was the late 90s and it looked like there might not be an economy. Uh, and if you didn't notice in the late 90s when suddenly there might not have been an economy, it's because that's when the, the so-called, at that point, Greenspan put the very aggressive interventionist moves by uh, large-scale uh, uh, governmental and and other fiscal players were were made in order to basically pump a lot of money into the system, uh, which was then also the response to the dot-com boom, and then also the response to the global financial crisis, and then the response to basically everything else that's happened uh, in the last you know closing in on thirty years now, uh, and it's not like that was the the last gasp of sanity or anything, but um, the Black-Scholes equation is is an interesting piece of work. It's also a complete fantasy. Uh, the markets are not normally distributed, never have been, uh, mm -hmm. and have become radically less normally distributed since we decided to integrate the Black-Scholes equation directly into the primary structure of how all markets work, which is where we are today. Uh, so. So all of that has basically driven the markets to becoming less and less valuable, which makes them more and more costly, which allows our financial uh, uh, players to take up more and more of the economy. And so that system uh, is all the result of algorithms that 
frankly, even the people creating them don't understand uh, uh, hitting reality and and determining the falsehoods intrinsic in in their misunderstandings. When somebody's creating an algorithm, um, is it um, trial and error? In the beginning, or does the someone like kind of already have an idea of like how it's going to work? It's X, Y, and Z. It's cut and dry, or like some of these advanced ones. Is it like, hey, I might have to like because I'm semi familiar with coding and stuff like that. Sometimes you put a code in, you might have to adjust it so that it works with the rest of the line of code or something like that. Is this something that you have to account for when it comes to building algorithms, or is this something that doesn't affect? any of that uh so there there definitely is trial and error and the there's a there's a real difference between operating in theory and operating in practice and so um even if you have a a well-developed algorithm um you can still make mistakes when you're coding it up um there's something called binary search uh which if if you have a big sorted list and you want to know whether or not some specific thing is in that big sorted list uh, one thing you can do, um, you know, you guys look like you're old enough, you would still know what a phone book is. One thing you could do is just read through the phone book linearly until you get to the name you're looking for. And if the name you're looking for is Alex Adams, that might not be a bad strategy. But if you're looking for me <laughs> or Michael, you might be doing this for a while. Um, so what binary search says is, what if you, you know, you know how long the list is, what if you go to the middle element of the list and figure out whether or not that element is the thing you're looking for, because maybe it is, but, you know, probably not. But if it isn't, is it too high or too low? And if it's too high, then you've got a new high end. So you reset your list instead of being the front of the list and the back of the list. Now you're doing the front of the list and the middle of the list. If it's too low, you reset the bottom end. Now you go the middle of the list to the top of the list and you dump it back into the algorithm. And once again, you know, you don't, you haven't seen it yet. Look at the halfway point. And the linear thing has what's known as linear time. So if you've got a thousand things in your list, on average, it'll take you 500 lookups to figure out whether or not something is there or not there. If you've got a million things in your list, it'll take you about 500,000. Uh, the other one is what's known as logarithmic time. Uh, with a million things in the list, it'll take about 20 lookups for you to know whether or not the thing you're looking for is there or not there and where it is. So obviously 20 is a lot smaller than 500,000. Um, <laughs> and in general, when you're doing this algorithmic analysis, there's a pretty large you know, toolkit of off the shelf ideas like that, that's known as divide and conquer or binary search that you are gonna try to fit together to kind of come up with an approach to solve the problem. But then you actually have to solve the problem. And binary search is rather interesting because the sort of textbook standard way uh, to implement binary search was I think published back in the 60s. And it turned out, uh, in, uh, I, I think I read the paper in, that came out in uh, like 2002 uh, that determined that, that that algorithm had actually had a bug in it that didn't show up um, because nobody had been able to put together a machine that had sort of enough addressable memory for the word size of the system. So the, the standard binary search algorithm had a buffer overflow in it, uh, and and that could only show up if you had so much disk space on your machine that you basically would use the entire word size of your machine to address it. So more than four hundred four four billion, uh, uh, you know, uh, words. So roughly sixteen gigabytes. Um, and again. You can remember when when computer memories were measured in megabytes and so on. So uh, so yeah, it, it that was that was this theoretical sort of math problem that that got used by people for you know about half a century uh, that had a bug in it that entire time that just sort of never came up, 
and then and then systems got big enough that the bug got exposed and then you know it's it's a it's an easy fix once you understand that's what the problem is so when in the commodities market is is the algorithm used to decide like when to invest because hey at this certain time in the future is going to be the best or is it more of hey this is how this future is going to go you know up and down for you know how about whatever time frame it is that an algorithm would work well so there are many many algorithms basically colliding in the existing commodity markets the existing marketplace mm -hmm. is operating an algorithm where it keeps to what are known as priority queues. So it's basically a line, but you can skip the line by offering a better price. So the system is first come first serve, but if you want a higher level than just when you decide to show up, you could also say, okay, well, these are the prices that are ahead of me in line. I'm gonna offer a better price than them. So I get to skip ahead of them in the line. And so it's got these two big lists of buyers and sellers. And if those, the fronts of those lists cross each other, if the guy that's offering the best price to buy and the guy that's offering the best price to sell are offering prices that are compatible with one another, um, then it records the trade. Now, that's, that's a little simplistic because as it turns out, what they're actually doing is not doing individuals, they're doing all the people that come in in one particular microsecond with the same deal. And it turns out that there's lots of them. And so there might not be in, in one given microsecond, there might not be enough people at the front of, the, of one line to match up with the front of the other line. So what they then need is this settlement algorithm that breaks down the people that are inside those groups um, and figures out who of the people who are all first come best price will get the deal that everybody that's there wants and how to cut it up and distribute it out among those, those, those people. Um, and because it takes them time to do that, once they do that, they actually shut down the entire marketplace for several microseconds while they're doing that calculation um, in order to figure out what's going on. Once they've figured out who's traded with who and they've recorded that information, they publish the information that a trade has occurred. Uh, and then the cycle starts over again. And so there's there's a great deal of jumping in and jumping back out of the marketplace as other people have developed algorithms to do that for themselves at various times slices. Some people are operating in that sort of millisecond to microsecond range. Some people are operating at much longer ranges than that. Um, but it's all, it's pretty much all algorithms all the time sort of fighting with each other. And what I did is said, okay, well, at the end of the day, what people actually care about are the prices that they're going to be paying for their business and receiving for their business. And yeah. that's a human process. And so they need prices that remain stable over human decision frames. And so uh, we can reorganize this around mass trade versus organizing it around this instantaneous price uh, pricing structure. And by doing that, you can actually decrease the cost of the marketplace to the participants, which for informed players that are bringing information to the market increases their rate of return. And for producers and consumers that are bringing product and, and cash respectively to the market, it increases their rates of return as well. Um, and it's also a lot easier to administer and, and implement. Very interesting. Um, we have a couple segments we like to do um, each podcast. Um, one of them is called No Dumb Questions. This is where we allow one of our audience members to listen to the show to actually submit a question for a future guest. And the question that we have for you is, do we actually or do I actually have to be good at math to um, be an algorithmic? to actually be able to do this at a high level? Like, do you have to actually understand uh, any high level of mathematics or can you kind of get by just having a, a base level 
of mathematics knowledge? There, so effectively what happens once you get into algorithmic study is that there is no level of math that you can learn, which is in fact sufficient. So you can get started right now with what you got, but if you want to keep playing the game and getting better, you're going to have to learn a lot more math than you currently do. And you're going to have to keep learning a lot more math than you currently do, because no matter how much you know, it's just not enough. Um, and, you know, there are, there are key ideas from calculus. Uh, uh, you know, AI is much in the news. The, the AI is currently being used to refer mostly to generative uh, systems that are using the neural net uh, technology. The, the way neural nets function um, is a feedback mechanism which is ultimately based on an algorithm for estimating that we trace back to uh, Isaac Newton uh, as its sort of primary uh, uh, popularizer, but actually, I believe 70 years before him, another guy named Raphson, so it's known as the Newton-Raphson method. Um, all evidence is that Newton actually also it was, it was an independent discovery, but uh, this technique is, is actually significantly more effective. Uh, we'd mentioned before about binary search. Uh, I, I was once on a, you know, a phone screen and asked a binary search question, but not for, you know, a hundred or a million, but for a trillion element list uh, that had some other characteristics. And the binary search on trillion element list would be roughly 40 uh, actions to, to find what you're looking for. Um, if you use uh, the newton raphson method instead, um, that would shrink to five to six. Uh, and there are ways that you could use um, the way that data is chunked on disks to pick a, uh, what's known as a block size, uh, such that your you would have effectively a a 100% chance of your first disk access actually containing uh, the data that you need, um, uh, either confirmatory or disconfirmatory. Um, and if it didn't, um, the second one would you know another you know if you got if you had six nines of of certainty the first time you'd have 12 nines of certainty for the second lookup and 24 nines of certainty for for the third. Um, so it would it would converge unbelievably rapidly on, on the right answer. Um, and so again, that's that's a that's a trick you pick up from calculus. Uh, and and that's that's sort of how it works. Um, topology, uh, calculus, um, uh, are both foundational to the ideas that went into the system that I designed, uh, along with game theory. Cool. Uh, out of curiosity, um, for your future using this professionally, do you have any lofty goals, anything that, you know, in a perfect world, things go your way, you'd love to see happen? Or like a, you would love to work on in the future or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm absolutely convinced that computers are a bigger deal than steam engines and that steam engines required uh, a, a more or less total overhaul of the institutions that allowed civilization to exist in order to actually be used in ways that were valuable. And so I think that that's what we're looking at today. I think that unless our governments, religions, you know, families, markets, and everything else get restructured in ways that are actually helpful, uh, what we'll do instead um, is figure out how to use these machines in ways to rip those structures apart, and they will collapse and we'll have nothing to replace them with. Uh, and so, so I, I think that this is an exceptionally exciting and dangerous time to be alive. Uh, and in the event that I manage to create markets that function, uh, I would like to think about where else this particular approach might have application uh, or do other, you know, deep dives into other ideas about where, where these things could go. When you think 
develop markets you mean like something aside from dow jones from nasdaq from that type of stuff yeah 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 those systems have no future sadly uh they are actively collapsing and it is i don't think that that's a controversial statement to make in spite of the fact that i'm the only person who says it because as i said the costs associated with operating them have been increasing faster than the values of the systems that they're operating in conjunction with um, for 50 years now. Uh, and that isn't sustainable. Uh, and we are, we are watching it de-sustain quite, quite actively. Um, and so, you know, what happens to a society when all of its successful people are parasites? Well, it collapses. Hmm. Very interesting. We see a lot of that actually. Yeah. Funny that you say that. We see a lot of similar type behavior in the sports card space, um, you know, amongst a lot of like the big industry executives and stuff like that. So um, it, it is real interesting to hear you say a lot of that, yeah. um, you know, in that regard. Um, Michael, do you have any uh, final questions that you'd want to ask Noah before we let him go today? Um, the only other thing I had is when I look at your information, it says that, you know, breakthroughs in industry theory and computerized game theory. Not game as in games you play, right? Uh, not, not so much. So game theory, as I commonly say, is the most flippantly named thing in human history. Game theory is the mathematics of strategy. Uh, there was a guy named Morgan Stern uh, that got things started uh, with a paper from the 1920s. Um, and this is one of the really cool things. There's been an enormous amount of mathematical breakthroughs in the last century or so. And, and they are all heavily, uh, you know, integrated with the people that actually built the internet. So it's very cheap and easy to just go out and read all this stuff if you if you're up for it. It does take a long time because there's a lot of it and it's not the easiest stuff to read, but uh, it's really fascinating. It's not not easy to read because it isn't written well. It's not easy to read because your brain doesn't work that way yet. But um, the other guy uh, that really turbocharged it uh, was a guy named John von Neumann, uh, who is, among other things, responsible for the implosive design of nuclear weapons and computers. Um, he he basically led the team that built practical uh, computing designs. Uh, it is the the current architectural design of CPUs to this day is known as von Neumann architecture because he invented that. Um, the that work um, on strategy has some application to the kinds of games that people play. Uh, there are certain mixed strategy extractions that around poker, for example, uh, von Neumann liked playing poker. Uh, there's also certain analysis around yeah. games like chess and checkers, um, such that we understand that they are either, uh, determinant first player wins or determinant draws. Uh, it is widely suspected that chess is in fact a draw. Uh, it is also known because checkers has actually been solved that um, that checkers is a a draw if played perfectly. Um, but uh, game theory got sort of a shot in the arm from two events of the 20th century. The first was the Cold War, uh, where a great deal of game theory development was done around the design of America's uh, deterrent strategy. In fact, the deterrent strategy was proposed, I believe, by von Neumann uh, as, as his sort of, you know, contribution. And then the other one, if you've ever seen the film A Beautiful Mind or read the book that it's based on, uh, John Nash uh, and his Nash equilibrium concept, which is, in fact, a game theory concept uh, for determining certain important things about, about uh, strategic systems and, and stability structures. And so game theory gives us a set of tools to examine things that are as diverse as economics, uh, evolution, ecology, uh, and poker. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a, it, it, it provides an interesting family of approaches, 
that I was able to to put together for this system. All right. Um, so yeah, yeah. We got you. Anyway, final segment. My apologies. Um, having a little technical difficulty here, but final segment we always go into is we have to ask, but you do not have to answer. Um, sometimes it's a serious question. Sometimes it's silly. Um, today it's a little bit of both. Um, if you had to write an algorithm for a world peace, what would that look like? Oh, well, I've actually had this discussion with people before. I don't really understand what world peace means. Um, uh, you know, we've got the Plato quote, only the dead will, will see the end of war. Um, and uh, the the conflict structure um, uh, do, is not without its benefits. Sadly, um, it's the only way I can see to kill leaders, and you know you have to do something with the bastards. Uh, so, um, uh, in the event that there are no human conflicts, would that result in? Uh, basically people overstressing the environment to the point where everything just broke down. The, the, we, live, we live in a world of constraint. Um, and while, while it, is, it is nice to operate within a lawful structure among people that don't lie and don't assault and don't kill and don't extort, um, uh, I'm unaware of how to produce an external force that creates that. Like we, humans are what we got. Um, so if I were going to sort of do this seriously, it would have to start with the uh, philosophers and, uh, and theologians to operationalize ethics um, using the actual tools of computational logic. Because right now, unfortunately, while math has done an enormous amount of work to rescue itself from the sort of catastrophic breakthroughs of the early 20th century, and physics has done some work to rescue itself from the catastrophic breakthroughs of the early 20th century, um, the other important phases of our of our collective project have done no work whatsoever to deal with those problems and are presently operating purely in fantasy land. Um, and, uh, and, you know, with, with people who are operating purely in fantasy land, having all the bullets and all the money, um, you shouldn't be terribly ex surprised that, that unbelievably hideous things are happening all the time. Uh, I would hope, <laughs> that restoring some form of sense and structure uh, to these things would would help out matters in some way. Uh, but I I couldn't say one way or another on on that. Uh, I I'm doing I'm doing this in that hope. And you know, we'll see how far I get and how far all of us get. For sure. So that was a really great answer. I yeah. appreciate that um is there anywhere that people watching this can follow you or anything that you would like people to go and support uh well absolutely um so i'm on linkedin i'm noah healy there uh there's also a website cordis.com you can learn more about my system i started a petition um this is back when i thought the Patent Office wasn't even going to hear my plea for another year. Uh, instead, they heard me a year ahead of schedule and came up with something that was entirely insane. Uh, so I'm currently trying to appeal that, but I am kind of using it as a barometer. Uh, so if people would like to sign that and perhaps, uh, you know, at least stick a name next to, to uh, encouragement of us having an economy someday, uh, that would be great. It's up on change.org under CDM underscore patent. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I said, um, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my work is on the web and you can reach out and contact me. I'd be happy to talk to you. Awesome, man. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. Yes. 
I appreciate it very much. Um, guys, again, make sure you go and uh, connect with him on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, uh, sign that petition. If you would, it'd be helpful for him. Um, again, we appreciate you joining us for another episode of Achieve More. Make sure you go over to Huddle Card Collection and uh, check out Michael there. Come over to Pittsburgh. Check out me and actually watch the um, video version of the podcast. We appreciate that. Until next week, guys, we hope you have a wonderful day, and God bless you. Thanks, everybody. I'm from the city.